All right, so now that we've talked about the different types of sonar, let's talk about how to get some good imaging. The first step is identifying your target. What is your target? Okay, what is it? Point number two is what frequency should I use? Okay, well, some systems out there will only have a single frequency. And if you only got a single frequency, that's the only frequency you got. Um, but some systems out there, uh, typical uh, professional grade systems will have at least two frequencies. Um, you're gonna have a lower frequency that you're gonna use for your search. And then you're gonna have a higher frequency that you're going to use for the identification of the object. Frequency is mostly, frequency of sound anyway, is mostly expressed in what is known as hertz, okay? And if you have a thousand of those vibrations or more within one second, it's known as a kilohertz. Most side scan is, is mentioned or labeled in that kilohertz um, frequency zone. Down in the bottom of this slide, you will see the the uh, translation between kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz systems. Low frequencies have very good range. High frequencies have very short range. Why wouldn't we just use low frequency all the time? If we want you know, to be able to see, we want to see at a good range. So why wouldn't we just use low frequency all the time? Because high frequency gives you better resolution. Well, how does that work? Let's get to the next slide and talk about that. So we saw in the guitar string that big giant wave from that low frequency. Well, it's that wave is all connected. It's not broken up, right? So it's one continuous wave as it goes out. Well, when it hits an object, it's gonna hit it and it's gonna, some of that sound will absorb by the object and some will bounce back, okay? But if there is a separation in the object, what it's going to do, like the top of your screen here. So if you're looking at the slide, we have two rocks, right? That big giant sound wave can't fit between the two rocks. That's why I outlined this one in red, this little arrow, because that sound wave can't fit. If it can't fit, we can't resolve the difference between the two rocks. Resolve is resolution, okay? So if it can't fit through, it's automatically going to bounce back once it hits the two rocks, and it will make your imaging appear as if there is one rock instead of two. So now if we look at this far image over uh, to our right, we can see the two rocks. The wave could not fit between them, and so it makes the two ro rocks look like one rock. Make sense? Now we're gonna look at the bottom and look at high frequency. The higher the frequency, the smaller the wave, the more spaces it can fit through, okay? So you will be able to distinguish things. If you have a really, really high frequency, you'll be able to see fingers, okay? If you don't have high frequency, you're gonna see a mitten, okay? You won't be able to distinguish the difference between the two fingers or two rocks or two tires or to whatever on the bottom, okay? So you get higher resolution out of higher frequencies because the waves are small enough to fit in the cracks and crevices of the object. But again, that higher frequency doesn't have the energy to go out and come back um, at long distances. You'll run out of energy. So you typically start with a lower frequency to do your search. And then you use your higher frequency to get better resolution after you've found your object with the lower frequency. So start with your lower, scan, find your object or multiple objects that are out there. And again, those are anomalies that match the parameters of your target. And then you're gonna raise your frequency, lower the toefish, scan again, and then see the image at a higher resolution, okay? So this is how that works. And again, so if you look at the two images on your left, the top one, it will combine the two objects together to make it look like one object. And the lower image here, we're seeing the wave or the frequency can fit between the two rocks and it will distinguish the two rocks from each other. So you see two rocks instead of one rock. 
That's the quick difference between low and high frequency. Let's move on to number three. Range is one of those things that people wanna go in and see as far as they can, right? So they're gonna range out and try and cover as big vast area as they can all at one time and they end up missing their target. They miss their target. So if we look at the image here in the, in the PowerPoint presentation, you'll see that gold line in the middle. That gold line is part of the nadir. Um, we're going to talk about nadir in, a, in an upcoming slide, so I'm not going to get into what nadir is. But imagine from that gold line off to the left-hand side, we have 100 feet. That's called 100 feet of range. Okay, and then we have 100 feet from the gold line off to the right-hand side. That's also called range. You have your port range and you have your starboard range. The gold line is where your transducers are, and each transducer is looking off to their individual side. Okay, so you're gonna have two ranges, a port range and a starboard range. Those ranges combined to be called swath. At 100 feet of range, 200 feet of swath, how big is your object gonna be that you're viewing on that 15 inch monitor computer um, that's sitting in front of you, okay? So imagine the center of your screen, 100 feet off the one side, 100 feet off the other side, how big's the body appearing on that screen? Is it going to be big enough for you to see? So you may have a decent low frequency, like say 900 kilohertz, right? Uh, 900, that's, that's the, really the upper end of low frequency, um, but we're, it's, it's one of them. So 900 will give you the 280 feet or so of range um, off to one side. That's uh, over 500 feet of range. We'll just call it 300 feet of range on one side, 300 feet of range on the other. That's 600 feet of total swath. How big is that body going to appear on your screen? It's going to look like a couple of pixels. Okay, so, and we can see this by, if you can see my mouse and I'm circling my mouse around this rock. That rock is approximately five feet long, okay? And so 10 feet would be, I don't know, from about here to about here. That's 10, you know, 10% 10 of this distance going across. So at 100 feet of range, that's about how big your body is going to appear on the screen. Would you, as an inexperienced side scan operator, um, be able to tell that that is or is not a body. We want to range in, okay? Take that 100 feet of range down to say 65 feet of, now we're going to move on to the fourth key feature, fourth key thing on how to get good imaging. Depth is where everybody screws up, okay? Depth is why, one of the main reasons why you're not getting good imaging. You don't know where to set that toe fish in the water column to get the imaging, okay? Or if they, they're scared to put the toe fish in the water because they might hit something, so they put it all the way up at the top of the water. Or they have a hole mounted system and they're trying to use that hole mounted system in very, very deep water, okay? And when that hole mounted system, again, you got to adjust it but the, the depth of the water plays a part in that. So um, let's talk about the reasons why. We call this the 10% rule, okay? So whatever your range is set to, so if you have 100 feet of range, we need to set the depth of the sonar to be able to see that 100 feet, okay? Um, and we call this the 10% rule. The, to the tow fish or the transducer. This is where we're gonna separate from hull mounted systems and tow fish when we're talking about side scan. So we're gonna, we're gonna mention the transducer. Doesn't matter if it's mounted on the hull of your boat or if it's mounted on a tow fish. The transducer for the sonar needs to be 10% off the ground of the range that you're looking out. 
So if you look at this little graph here, or the little picture, we have 100 feet of range. And the towfish is 10 feet high. If you're at 40 feet of range, you need to be four feet high. 60 feet of range, six feet high. The towfish could care less about how much water is above it. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're in two feet of water, 20 feet of water, 200 or 2,000 feet of water. The towfish only cares, or the transducer only cares about how much water is below it. So, again, if you're looking at 100 feet, it wants to be. 10 feet or 10% of the range off the bottom. Everybody out there who's new to side scan, for some reason, can't grasp this concept, okay? And so they, they, they mess around with ranges and they mess around with frequencies and they can't figure out how to get um, their height correct, okay? Um, so here's, here's a couple of things on, on how to make it easy for you. Uh, for one, the best range to look for bodies is between 65 and 75 feet. Why? Because on a normal laptop, it's going to make the body big enough for you to see on the screen. So at 70, we'll just put in the middle of that, 70 feet of range, how high do you need to be off the bottom? Seven feet. So at seven feet high off the bottom, you're able to see along the bottom and in the water column and all of this space really clear, okay? Um, well, why is that? So we call this the flashlight theory. And I got a whole bunch of different theories for you. So we had the 10% theory or the thumb theory in the last one. This one is the 10% or the flashlight theory. And so I moved my computer back so you can see my arm as I'm holding it up. Um, and we're going to use a flashlight to explain this. And what it is, is everybody has seen, every, hang on, I'm getting interruptions here with admit people. Let me admit these. All right. Um, so with the flashlight theory, everybody's seen how the FBI holds their flashlight. It's up and it's out and it's front of them, right? Why do they hold it up like this? Um, well, there's a couple of different things. One reason they say that the bad guy down there um, will see the flashlight and he'll shoot at the flashlight instead of, instead of the body. Yeah, that, that's okay, but most of the time bad guys can't aim that good, and so they're going to shoot you anyway. But the real purpose of it is to silhouette the body. If they hold the flashlight out in front of them, it, it creates a silhouette, and so you can't see what is behind it. Okay, you're only seeing what's in front and you hold it out and up so it's pointing across the room or across the way from you. And it will evenly illuminate everything out there that is away from you. But it's creating that shadow here where I am. Okay, and then if you take that same flashlight, and instead of holding it out in front of you, you put it at the ground next to your feet. It will really illuminate the ground next to your feet, but it won't send a whole bunch of light down range, okay? And so we want to be able to evenly illuminate from your feet all the way down range without silhouetting you or brightening your feet and not getting light down to where it needs to go. So according to physics, that's 10% of the range you wanna see, okay? So it's physics we raise the flashlight 10% off the ground based on the distance we want to look across and it will evenly illuminate everything from the ground underneath the towfish all the way out to the end of your range. And so we can look at that here and I'm gonna get a little annotation tool. Let me make sure I got it. And so we want to be able to see all the way across and up. So at that 10%, um, we will be able to illuminate all of that evenly. If, if our towfish is too low, say our towfish is too low, right? We will illuminate a whole lot here but not get any light down here. 
So who's seen that? Where they put their towfish all the way down and the ground right beside the towfish starts becoming really, really bright, right? That's because your towfish is too low. And then you'll get the scared people that don't want to injure their towfish, and so they'll keep their towfish up here. So they end up with a whole bunch of light down here and they get no light. Let me change colors. And they get no light here. So all of this will end up in shadow and they won't be able to see it. Clear all my little drawings out. Um, so that's the reason for it. Uh, if we raise the towfish, we get too much light here and not enough light here. If we lower the towfish, we get too much light here and not enough light out there. Um, so you want to be at that 10%. And that 10% is going to give you even illumination across the bottom and up to your height. I hope that makes a little more sense. So now how does that separate towfish from hull mounted systems? All right, well, let's think about that for a second. If we are in, I gotta break my annotation tool back out. If we are in 50 feet of water, right? If we are in 50 feet of water, that means the transducer is mounted of your whole mounted hummingbird, Lowrance, uh, Simrad, whatever, it's mounted right here. And we have a distance of 50 feet from there to the bottom, okay? we have to adjust our range now based on the depth of the water. We would end up going backwards, okay? You normally wanna start off with target frequency, then range, and your range, that 100 feet of range, will dictate the height of the towfish off the bottom. But if you can't lower your transducer, you are stuck with the depth of the water. Right, so if your transducer is mounted to the hull of your boat, your depth has to be uh, consistent with the depth of the water. And so you have to base your range off your depth instead. So if you're in 50 feet of water, that means your range will have to be 500 feet. Can't really draw the little zeros there, but 500 feet on both sides. So that's a thousand feet of range. How big is your body going to be at a thousand feet of range? So now we need to think of where in the depth um, does it make it good for having a hull mounted system for body recovery? Well, I found uh, between uh, 15 and 20 feet of water is about the max you want to use a hull mounted system when you're searching for a body because at 100 or uh, at 15 feet of depth, you're at 150 feet of range. Now your body is gonna be really small at that point, but it, it is possible um, to locate. And if once you have a lot of good experience, um, you can go up to about uh, 20 feet of depth and 200 feet of range, but then your body's gonna be really small on your screen, especially with some of those uh, monitors that, that they use on whole mounted systems. <coughs> so that's why a good towfish or a, a system that you can raise and lower in the water to keep your range consistent um, is, is what's going to do best for, for most um, agencies. Now, if you have uh, really shallow water and you're not going to be doing uh, body recovery in um, these different, um, different environments and you're going to be uh, just staying with um, that shallow water, that's fine. All right, let's check out. That is the last of our, of our four uh, keys to getting good imaging. Again, it's target then what? Frequency, then range, then depth. You can master those four things. You will get good imaging out of any system you're using. So your nadir is what is going to tell you the height of the towfish off the ground, okay? And everybody thinks, or, or I should say the, the biggest misconception of the nadir 
is that you're a missing an area below the boat. Okay, so let's talk about what the gold line is in the middle of this thing first. So we have this gold line, right? And that's actually your, that, that is the towfish. That, that, that gold line is the towfish. And if you look at the gold line, it's actually divided into two gold lines. There's a gold line, then a dark area, then a gold line. And what that is, is uh, that is each transducer. And your, the transducer, as it is sending that sound signal out, it is hitting the inside of the outside of your towfish or your transducer housing. And so that first immediate return is this gold line. And so that is a awesome indication of where your towfish or where your transducer actually is um, in, in relation to the world around it. So now, what is this black area? So we see this black area between our transducer and what we call the first bottom return. The first bottom return is where the ground starts, okay? And so you'll see right there where the ground starts is your first bottom return, okay? And then we have this black area between the two. That black area is the indication of the height of your towfish or the height of the transducer. You will see that there's two black areas. There's one on each side. So you have a, a height designation for each transducer. So if you have two, one on the port, one on the starboard, you will have your height on the port and on the starboard. So one side may be bigger than the other side. If one side is bigger than the other side, your towfish may be tilted or you are on a slope. Okay, so if you are on a slope like this, the nadir on this side will be smaller than the nadir will be on this side because the height for your, this transducer will be different from the other transducer. Does that make sense? Um, so you can measure these out. If we call this a hundred feet of range, right? And a hundred feet of range on this side, that's 200 feet of total swath. Um, we will measure these dark areas out and they should measure 10 feet. Now it is not that you're missing 10 feet below the boat, or if you combined your swath, it'll be 20 feet, right? Because this one is 10 feet and this one is 10 feet. Um, and if you combine those, it's 20 feet. So people will measure that and say, I'm missing 20 feet below my boat. That's not what it is, it's the water column. So here's an easy way to look at it. The tip of my finger is the gold bar. That's your transducer, okay? that my hand is going to represent the dark area, right? Um, that again is the height of the towfish off the bottom. And then my wrist is going to indicate the first bottom return. So the first bottom return is where the ground, ground starts. And then you have the rest of the ground, which is my arm. So I'm gonna move this back. So we have range one, right? Here's our port, here's our starboard. The two intersect together, right? Right there, that's our towfish. That's our gold line. Then we have the water column and the water column. First bottom return, first bottom return. On the screen, it's gonna be in 2D, right? 2D. In real life, it's 3D. Oh, look at that. So you have the towfish, the water column, the first bottom return, and the ground. We have to be able to depict that on a screen for you to be able to measure the height of your towfish off the bottom. So that is why you have that gold line and the two black areas and then the ground. It's just a measurement of how tall your towfish is. And in good versions of software, depending on um, the manufacturer of your software, um, that you'll see a couple of sets of dotted lines coming up and down your screen. And we'll see those here in just a second in the next slide. But as long as you keep that first bottom return next to that dotted line, you know your towfish is at the proper height. So if you lower the towfish, your nadir gets smaller. If you raise the towfish, the nadir gets bigger. Again, that's a representation of the height of the towfish. So you will raise or lower the towfish to make the nadir bigger or smaller till you get your 10%. The 10% will be guided by a set of dotted lines. So we're gonna switch this one. Now you can see these dotted lines here, and those dotted lines are gonna tell us that 
this first closest dotted line is 10%. This second dotted line is 20%. We want to make sure our, our nadir or our first bottom return falls between those two sets of dotted lines, closer to the 10% line. The closer we are to the 10% line, the um, better the resolution we will get out of the system. All right. And so with that being said, if we move out or we raise the towfish, that nadir will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and your resolution will get worse and worse and worse. Okay. If you lower the towfish and the toe and you get closer to the ground than that 10%, again, your resolution will start to decline because you're getting too close to the bottom. All right, so now let's talk a little bit. I got to move these, this little chat room over so I can see my screen. All right, so again, with this image, we're seeing the towfish up here at the top, right? That's it right there. And we are seeing it's what its image would look like in the screen. And then we see the nadir and our first bottom return. So here's our first bottom return. And then we got our imaging of the ground. And we have this wheel type object here in the middle. That wheel type object um, is, we'll just call that our target for now. Um, so as the side scan is flowing through the water and it's sending out a single frequency, right? That frequency is moving out across, right? Um, when it first hits the water, that frequency comes out of the transducer. It is not hitting anything, right? It hasn't hit the ground yet. And so as it's coming out, it's coming down and it hasn't hit anything. And if it hasn't hit anything, nothing is reflecting back to the towfish to give you an image. So if there is no sound reflecting back, it's going, the, the software is going to depict black as the image, okay? And you will start getting imaging once that frequency wave hits the ground. So you'll see right here where that frequency hits that first bottom return is where portions of that frequency start bouncing back to the side scan. That's when you start picking up these different densities going along the bottom. So then as the frequency starts moving across the screen, more and more of that frequency is bouncing back to the towfish and you are getting all of these pixels in here. Now remember, it's only doing that very top row of pixels at a time, uh, but we're gonna talk about this pixel as it goes through the uh, middle of our wheel here. So here's our wave again. It's moving forward and across our screen, and once it hits our wheel type object, this whole lower half of that frequency wave is going to either be absorbed by our object or reflect back to the towfish. The amount of sound that reflects back to our towfish will give us this bright line right here. Okay, now again, because it's a big chunk of sound that's going back all at one time, that's why we get this bright mark here. Okay, the darker shades are lower densities or lower reflections. Okay, and so now the wave is gonna travel across the top of our object and it's still returning sound, right? And that's why we get all the, the imaging from inside our wheel. But then the frequency wave comes to the end of our wheel type object. Well, our wheel type object is off the ground and all of this frequency right here was already sent back. So once our frequency exits the top of the wheel, it's no longer touching an object. If it's not touching an object, it can't be reflecting sound back. So we have to wait for that wave to hit the ground again before we start reflecting energy or reflecting that frequency back to the towfish. So everything where the wave is not touching the ground, we get a shadow. Make sense? Because this portion was already sent back. We can't regrow the wave in the middle of its scent. And so we have a missing wave out here. And so once it hits the ground again, we start reflecting more sound off the ground and we again create an image. So that's the difference of how all of this frequency works. 
okay? So we can see that frequency go across and we hit an object. Again, the more dense the object is, the brighter it will be because it is reflecting more sound. We'll talk about that in a further or a, or a different webinar. We're gonna get, we're gonna break all of these individual topics down um, further. Today, we just wanna get a, a very basic grasp of what's going on. Um, so one of the things is why yellow? Why, why the yellow color? Um, well, it's a easy yet complicated question um, because you can change the color to whatever you want. Um, but you may change to a color that you can't see. Um, so a great portion of our population um, is colorblind to different colors, you know, whether it's reds or greens or, or, or blues or, or you name it. Um, a vast portion of our population is colorblind to certain colors. But if you're colorblind to green, it doesn't mean you can't see green. It just means you can't see all the shades of green. If you can't see all the shades of a particular color, then it would be hard for you to tell the difference between the different densities of the objects you're hitting. Um, because every object has a, has a completely different density than another object. So we use yellow. Yellow has the least amount of color blindness of any other color um, that, that you will ever see. And the reason being is our eyes evolved under sun and fire. And both of those are yellow forms of light, yellow, yellow uh, wavelengths. Um, so in the images that you'll see, you'll see everything that looks like from browns to reds to yellows and oranges, but believe it or not, they're all hues of yellow, okay? So a darker shade or hue of yellow or a brighter shade or hue of yellow. But when you see that to what we normally commonly call yellow, um, they appear either brownish or reddish or orangish. Um, so that's why we use that, um, because, because there's so many different millions of hues of yellow, we can change between really low densities being really dark brownish red color to really high densities being a really bright shade of yellow. Um, so that's why we stick with yellow. If you use greens or reds or uh, blues, um, then you have the possibility of meshing a couple of different densities together into the same color, and you may miss the difference uh, between concrete and metal, for example. They have very similar densities, and if you're using a, a, a color that you're slightly colorblind to, it could mesh those two colors together, and you won't be able to see the difference between metal and concrete. That's just a basic, basic example. 